Thank you, Dr. Vanis. Um, so good morning, everyone. So the topic of my presentation is going to be bladder neck contractors following uh, radical prostatectomy. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Kavanaugh uh, for his help with this presentation. So uh, the objectives of this presentation uh, today are to review the diagnostic approach and evaluation of patients with bladder neck contractor following radical prostatectomy to understand the pathophysiology and predisposing factors to bladder neck contractor, as well as to learn about the current and uh, emerging surgical therapeutic options for patients with bladder neck contractor following radical prostatectomy. So before I start um, uh, the presentation, I just want to talk about this case here to kind of um, have this patient in mind as I go through the presentation. So uh, Mr. X here is a 68-year-old uh, uh, gentleman who is previously acting uh, active man with a successful career in business. And he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, which was uh, treated by radical prostatectomy followed by adjuvant uh, radiation. Um, then he presented to the office a few months later uh, with decreased urinary flow, which then progressed to urinary retention. And on cystoscopy in the office, um, there was necrotic tissue that was noted, as well as uh, stone formation proximal and distal to the bladder neck. He was initially treated, um, treated with three bladder neck um, incisions, and uh, when those procedures were performed, um, necrosis of the anterior bladder wall um, was noted, and he was offered an indwelling catheter and tried it, but unfortunately did not tolerate it. So the next step for him was um, to go on to perform self-calibration twice a day, and this was quite difficult for him, and if he missed a calibration, then he would see shortly after after tightening of his bladder neck, which was quite de debilitating as it required another dilation afterwards. Um, so at this point, he was essentially catheterizing to incontinence, which means that he was catheterizing to empty his bladder, but as a result, he was always incontinent and um, just, you know, having the, the to wear pads and, and having the smell of urine uh, kind of follow him was really um, debilitating to him and uh, really impacted his quality of life. So he ended up giving up his career um, and was quite unhappy. Um, and then eventually he it required a uh, cystectomy uh, with urinary diversion. And that was uh, kind of the only thing that really helped him uh, get back um, to his uh, regular life. So um, to give a bit of background here, uh, when it comes to surgical management of uh, localized prostate cancer, patients are managed either by um, radical retropubic prostatectomy, robot-assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy, or laparoscopy, um, laparoscopic prostatectomy. And although not incredibly um, common, vesicouteric anastomosis, uh, stricter, or bladder neck contractors um, is known to be a uh, complication that can lead to uh, quite debilitating symptoms uh, and have significant impact on quality of life, as I've mentioned with, with uh, Mr. X. And as we've been seeing more and more uh, robotic cases um, being uh, done, we've also seen uh, to a certain degree a decrease in uh, the rates of bladder neck contractors. But I also want to highlight here that um, obviously surgeons' experience plays uh, a role in the incidence of uh, bladder neck contractors, whether open or uh, robotic. Um, also, the retrospective nature of a lot of studies uh, that are found in the literature at this time has contributed to the heterogeneous data um, that we have when looking at uh, the incidence of bladder neck uh, contractors in patients following radical prostatectomy. Um, nonetheless, uh, the reported incidence of bladder neck contracture following um, retropubic radical prostatectomy usually ranges anywhere between 0.48 to 17.5%, with a weighted mean of 5.1%, uh, uh, whereas it ranges uh, between 0 to 3% for LAP uh, radical prostatectomy or RALP, with a weighted mean incidence of 1.1% for LAP uh, RP and 1.4% uh, for RALP. 
a group of uh, urologists at uh, UCSF have also looked at um, 988 patients undergoing radical prostatectomy, of which uh, roughly 70% had an open prostatectomy and 30% underwent a RAL. And they found that their um, overall incidence of um, bladder neck contractor was 2.2%, um, with the incidence of bladder neck uh, contractor following an RP was being 2.6%. Um, they kind of left it up to the surgeon as to whether or not to perform an autologous fascial sling at the time of the operation. Um, and they found that in patient where uh, an uh, autologous sling was performed, um, the incidence was somewhat higher, but it's not clear if there were other uh, patient specific factors that were at play. And um, another study performed uh, by uh, Specter and, and colleagues attempted to control for the bias related to multi-surgeon studies um, by looking solely at 113 uh, radical prostatectomies uh, performed by a single uh, surgeon with the help of residents and found no difference in incidence rates of uh, bladder neck uh, contractors between the two surgical approaches. So I think if anything, that really highlights the heterogeneity of the data uh, that's out there. Now, um, there are several risk factors that have been associated with the formation of uh, bladder neck contractor following radical prostatectomy. So in terms of patient-related risks, studies um, have found that uh, current cig cigarette smokers, uh, older gentlemen, um, patients with a history of a TERP, a history of uh, really high PSA, as well as uh, prior radiation to the pelvis, and patients with a history of uh, systemic vascular disease are at an increased risk of developing a bladder neck uh, contractor following surgery. Um, there's generally no difference between non-smokers and um, men with a remote history of smoking. And then in terms of technical risk factors, um, there's the surgical approach that comes into play, um, low surgeon volumes, uh, poor mucosal apposition, absence of uh, eversion of the mucosa, um, and the open approach, um, urinary extravasation and excessive narrowing uh, during the uh, racket handle repair. Um, and all these factors have been uh, associated with an increased risk for developing uh, BNCs following radical prostatectomy. Um, it was previously reported that blood loss was associated with bladder neck contractors, but newer studies have uh, shown that this is likely not the case. So when looking at the pathophysiology of bladder neck contractor following radical prostatectomy, uh, it's important to review the anastomotic uh, healing. So uh, Webb and colleagues performed a study where 100 patients underwent a uh, radical retropubic uh, prostatectomy and 100% uh, patients underwent a uh, RALP. The RRP group um, included a uh, conventional stomatization and racket handle repair, as well as mucosal uh, eversion. So stomatization here refers to the bladder mucosa being everted and sutured to the serosa to produce a fully everted um, pouting bladder opening. And the technical objective of the bladder neck anastomosis is to create a um, bladder stoma equal to the membranous uh, urethra circumference with a mucosal eversion to allow for mucosa to mucosa uh, urethral vesicle anastomosis. Um, they then performed their anastomosis with interrupted end-to-end -end sutures between the urethra and the bladder. The RALP anastomosis um, did not include any uh, bladder neck reconstruction or uh, mucosal eversion. There were uh, anywhere between uh, 12 to 14 uh, suture passes between uh, the bladder and uh, urethra. And aside from the uh, racket handle uh, repair, somatization of the bladder, mucosal eversion, and anastomotic uh, technique, both groups um, were uh, similar. And the rate of uh, bladder neck contractor in the RRP group was of 9%. And in the RALP group, um, they did not have any patients with uh, that complication. Now, I just want to uh, attract your attention uh, here to the figure on the right hand side. So uh, surgical principles of wound healing have previously postulated um, that any anastomosis in the urinary tract tends to undergo some degree of uh, shortening where the scar can contract up to a third of its uh, original circumference. Um, end to end circular anastomosis, um, like we see here, um, 
is uh, therefore more likely to have a smaller lumen, whereas uh, when a long ellipse uh, contracts, there should still be an adequate lumen, as you can see uh, in figure A. Um, now, wound healing by first intention will still undergo fibrosis and a degree of contractor, even uh, with normal and complicated uh, healing. But when healing is uh, compromised or uh, delayed, or if there is separation of the edges, healing by secondary intention will will then result in a significant uh, proliferation of myofibroblast cells and aggressive wound contractor uh, can be seen uh, at that point, like we see here in uh, the C uh, figure. Now, looking a bit more closely at uh, the anastomosis used in each surgical approach, uh, approach, we can see that in the open approach, there are sutures that are interrupted and uh, parallel to the anastomosis. So therefore, they wouldn't compromise the vasculature of either the bladder or the urethra unless they were um, tied too tight. Um, it's been postulated that the sutures that prevent the bladder stoma uh, expanding with bladder uh, filling, which might contribute to subsequent uh, bladder neck contractor, are those involved in stomatization and construction of the uh, racket handle. So these sutures are all bladder related sutures and they're separate from the anastomotic sutures between the bladder and the urethra, um, like we can see in this illustration here. So occasionally, regardless of the approach, uh, there can be uh, urinary leakage as a result of a significant gap in the uh, anastomosis. This gap will heal slowly um, by granulation and proliferation um, of uh, myofibroblast as well as aggressive um, wound contractor. So although uh, many have previously postulated that the urine leakage is the cause of bladder neck contractors, um, new studies have suggested suggested that actually urine leak is more so a sign of uh, a urethrovesical anastomotic gap, which then represents the true underlying pathology. And um, where uh, there is a gap, there is also a secondary, um, uh, second intention of fibrosis and a scar uh, from the body's repair of um, the anastomotic defect, which leads to a dense uh, bladder neck contractor. So uh, in short, mind the gap. Um, when looking at the anastomosis uh, performed in uh, RALP, so essentially the parachute anastomosis is performed in RALP surgery. And in this case series by Webb and colleagues, uh, laparoscopic examination of the parachute repair was performed before uh, inserting the final anastomotic suture. And what this showed is essentially that the upper uh, border bladder everts uh, the anastomosis and proximal membranous uh, urethra forming a dependent funnel um, like we can see uh, in this image here. So the parachute uh, repair involves many more sutures um, through the urethra than used um, in uh, the interrupted uh, anastomosis. Um, but uh, just like in the uh, interrupted uh, anastomosis approach, the tension lines of these sutures are parallel to the anastomosis between the bladder and uh, the urethra, and therefore blood flow and healing shouldn't be compromised here either. Um, the parachute repair is also full thickness layer to layer. Um, anastomosis that restores the um, normal funnel anatomy, um, if you will, of the bladder neck. And um, this repair uh, essentially creates an opening outwards of uh, the urethral stoma um, before creating a progressive funneling change in caliber from the bladder to the urethra, kind of giving it um, the endoscopic um, appearance of a uh, female bladder as a result. Um, there are uh, no abrupt transitions or a uh, ring between the bladder and uh, urethra. So uh, radiation therapy can also uh, obviously have a significant impact on the development of bladder neck contractor. So bladder neck contractor in this context can be seen up to uh, three years uh, following treatment. And when radiation therapy is uh, administered, there is an induction of apoptosis and inhibition of mitosis. And as a result, there is um, protein modifications as well as DNA, RNA, and um, cell membrane uh, damage. <laughs> 
And essentially, um, radiation therapy can also cause um, chronic uh, and arthritis, which can in turn significantly compromise the uh, vascularity and blood flow to the tissue, uh, which will lead to uh, impaired healing and uh, fibrosis and scarring. So uh, local um, growth factors and cytokines are also at play here uh, because they can also alter uh, metabolism of target tissues, which can in turn uh, impair tissue healing. Um, ionizing radiation um, leads to uh, tumor cell DNA damage. And as a result, we can see an increase in production of free radicals, uh, which can effectively affect the surrounding healthy tissues in many ways, including a obliterative uh, endarteritis or progenitor cell uh, apoptosis. When that happens, uh, we can see radiation necrosis um, that we, we can appreciate here on this um, bottom image uh, on the right hand side. Um, additionally, when there is accumulation of uh, free radicals, there's continuing um, fibrosis that can then lead to a complete obliteration um, of uh, the bladder neck, like we can see on the top image here, where we can't even pass a uh, guide wire. So in terms of uh, diagnosis of bladder neck uh, contractors, usually bladder neck contractors are diagnosed within the first two to six months following surgery. Um, it's important to obtain a detailed history, focus on lower urinary tract symptoms. Um, patients will usually present with a complaint of weaker uh, urinary stream, urinary incontinence, or deterioration of uh, urinary continence, as well as sensation of incomplete voiding. Um, it can sometimes be helpful to have patients complete a voiding diary or um, validated questionnaires. Um, it's also crucial to obtain a detailed previous medical history focused on the previous, um, previous treatments for prostate cancer, including adjuvant or salvage radiation therapy. Um, now, in terms of diagnostic um, modalities, cystoscopy is the primary mean and the gold standard to um, make a diagnosis of uh, bladder neck um, contractors. Um, also, um, bladder neck contractor is often defined in the literature by the inability uh, to pass a 16 French uh, flexible cystoscope into the bladder, uh, which can obviously uh, only be determined if a cystoscopy is uh, performed. Um, other adjuncts to diagnosis like a rug or a VCUG, Euroflow and PDRs can be performed, but um, are not routinely ordered, especially the rug and, and VCUG. So um, for the second part of uh, this presentation, I'm going to focus on uh, the conservative and minimally invasive endoscopic therapies, namely urethral dilation, self-calibration, CIC, transurethral incision, transurethral incision, and um, transverse mucosal realignment, which is a novel therapy, um, incision and injection, as well as uh, drug-coated uh, catheters and uh, stent insertion. So um, urethral dilation is usually the first uh, step in uh, management of bladder neck contractors for a lot of patients. Um, it usually consists of a dilation performed in the office, followed by a self-calibration regimen uh, performed by the patient. Um, because single dilation alone is usually not um, successful at maintaining a patent uh, bladder neck. And then in terms of the self-calibration, it'll usually vary and be tailored to um, every patient individually. So it could be once a week for some patients, or it could be daily or multiple times a day for, for others, like Mr. X that we talked about earlier. Um, this can also um, usually only be performed for uh, contractors that are short, soft, and uh, non-obliterated. Uh, From a Patient factor perspective, patients have to be really motivated and be able to tolerate the calibrations and be compliant with them because we often will see re-narrowing uh, of the contractor soon after the calibrations are stopped. Um, both clinicians and patients uh, should know that this procedure uh, can be associated with urinary incontinence or retention, gross hematuria infection, and traumatic insertion, which can in turn lead to um, false passage creation um, and then synchronous urethral uh, stricture, which is even more difficult to deal with. Um, 
And then all of these factors can neg uh, neg uh, like negatively impact um, patients' quality of life, of course. Um, a study performed by uh, Bersani, Bersarani and uh, colleagues also highlighted that although many patients can respond well to this regimen, a significant proportion of patients will require several in-office dilatations and um, others will progress to CIC. So all in all, although this can work for some patients, many will abandon uh, self-dilation regimens, uh, likely due to their negative impact on quality of life. Now, uh, with respect to urethral dilation and patient reported quality of life, there are several factors that come into play. Um, Luban and colleagues um, looked at the quality of life in men um, in 85 uh, men performing urethral dilation for reasons other than neurogenic bladder. And the median number of years performing self-catheterization was three with a median frequency of one um, dilation a day. And they found that um, younger patients uh, had a worse quality of life. And this was represented by a score of seven and above, as we can see um, on the graph here on the right hand side. They also found that um, patients struggled with uh, the psychosocial acceptance of uh, the regimen and um, had sexual concerns. And patients that were performing self-calibration uh, for proximal stricture and bladder neck contractors were found to have a worse quality of life, um, but were also found to have greater difficulty performing the calibration itself um, because it was thought to be related to the depth of calibration as well as to the angulation. Now, um, following urethral dilation and self-calibration, the next step in treatment is uh, transurethral bladder neck incision. Um, that can be performed uh, through various techniques, so using electrocautery, cold knife, laser, hot knife, or loop resectoscope. Um, there isn't much evidence comparing the different um, modalities to uh, one another. And so um, while bladder neck incision can be a good treatment option for, for patients, many require a second treatment or more before seeing a resolution of their bladder neck uh, contractor, um, as uh, Bobo Glue and colleagues have demonstrated. In terms of operative um, technique, Ramirez and colleagues have proposed, and this is how uh, our reconstructive urologist here at VGH does it, um, essentially uh, an incision performed at three and nine o'clock down to the periphysical fat. And that has the advantage of uh, releasing healthy tissue, but also it minimizes the risk of injury to the rectum. And in their experience, close to three quarters of their patients did not require a repeat intervention at 12 months. And of those with a successful first procedure, roughly 50% went on to have an AUS inserted to manage their uh, urinary incontinence without issues. And in a patient where treatment failure was absorbed, uh, observed um, after one um, bladder neck uh, incision, the procedure was repeated and about half of those patients elected to pursue um, urinary diversion or reconstructive uh, surgery following recurrence. So um, Nielsen and colleagues presented the results over a uh, course of 12 years, looking at 123 patients with bladder neck contractors as a result of uh, radical prostatectomy plus or minus uh, radiation for treatment of uh, localized prostate cancer. Um, as a result, uh, as a result of uh, radical prostatectomy, more or less, uh, yeah. So essentially, uh, they performed a uh, balloon dilation followed by an incision of the bladder neck uh, contractor. And they performed, again, a deep incision at uh, 3 and 9 o'clock using a uh, Collins knife only without any injections. And what they found was that um, at the 12-month follow-up, 82% of their patients had still um, evidence uh, of a patent bladder neck on cystoscopy after only one treatment. And an additional additional 15% of patients with initial treatment failure had successful outcomes after uh, the second treatment with transurethral bladder neck incision. And of the multiple um, variables that they studied, they found that um, having more than two prior uh, incisions of the bladder neck was a predictor for future um, treatment failure. <laughs> 
Now, uh, transurethral incision with transverse mucosal realignment is a new technique, um, and uh, it's endoscopic. And it essentially was described uh, by Abramovich and um, colleagues. The procedure itself consists of um, using a 26 French continuous flow uh, cystourethroscope with a visual obturator to first inspect the urethra at the level of the obstruction and in this case, the bladder neck. A guide wire is then passed through the stricter into the bladder and the stricter is dilated to a caliber of 24 French using S-shaped um, urethral dilators. And then the cystourethroscope is then reintroduced and um, the visual obturator is exchanged for a working element and a um, needle tip electrode, as you can see on the image on the top left here. In the case of a bladder neck contractor, the incisions are uh, performed at uh, three o'clock and uh, nine o'clock until the opening was uh, roughly 30 French uh, and until they were able to see healthy fat um, tissue. Um, once the incision was performed, um, the inner lumen of the working elements were removed, um, but the 26 French continuous flow was kept in position. And through the outer sheet, they were able to, they, they then proceed to insert a five French rigid ureteroscope and uh, the RD180 device, um, which are passed down uh, simultaneously into the bladder. And then the RD180 is used to grasp the middle, uh, the mid aspect of the proximal edge of the bladder mucosa and using a two uh, monoglide suture and a second throw um, is made uh, through the midpoint of the distal uh, urethral mucosa. The ureteroscope and the RD180 are then uh, removed out of the sheet, um, but the uh, sheath itself is uh, kept in position. And then the suture uh, thread is thread uh, through a one millimeter by two millimeter uh, titanium tie knot and then secured in position. And then what that does essentially is pulling the bladder mucosa distally to realign it to the urethral mucosa, like you can see uh, on the bottom here. This is where we start before the suture is uh, the, the stitch is performed. And then this is what the end result is. Um, because this is obviously a novel technique, there aren't uh, many validating, there aren't any other uh, validating studies uh, available yet, but the authors did report an 89% uh, percent success rate um, at six months following one procedure, and then 100% uh, success rate after uh, the second procedure um, in the two patients uh, where treatment initially failed. And in their experience, the patients uh, did not report any uh, de novo incontinence. Now, um, I'm going to move on to talk a bit more about um, transurethral bladder neck incision and steroid uh, injection. So here we're essentially talking about uh, triamcinolone, uh, which is a cortical steroid. Um, it enhances collagenase activity, and as a result, it leads to um, collagen breakdown and tissue remodeling, which what essentially prevents uh, scar formation. New and colleagues uh, looked at 18 patients with a history of bladder neck contractor following radical prostatectomy. And the mean time to stenosis following prostatectomy was eight months. Um, along the 18 um, patients included, uh, so essentially for the 18 patients that they included in their study, um, all of them combined had 128 uh, treatment failures that were recorded including 37 bladder and neck uh, dilations, 88 incisions, and two mitomycin C injections, and one um, alum stent placement uh, and uh, subsequent removal. Um, so a uh, roughly 40% uh, of uh, their patient population uh, included in the study did uh, self uh, catheterization prior to the procedure and the median number of treatment failure per patient was uh, five. And now the procedure was performed using a cold knife incision at the three o'clock, nine o'clock and 12 o'clock positions. And then the depth of incision was to the soft tissue and, and bleeding. 
And then you use the entire vial of uh, trimcinol um, and they injected it roughly evenly uh, through the three uh, incision sites. And then after the procedure, a Foley catheter was um, inserted and it was kept in situ for five to seven days following surgery. They had a uh, treatment uh, success rate of 83% uh, in their patients and 50% of their patients required more than one treatment. And the treatment failed uh, in the case of uh, three patients. Um, there was a 28% complication rate, and these included a gross hematuria, pubic pain requiring admission to hospital, urinary tract infection, and urinary retention. Now, we're looking at evidence uh, relating to this therapy. Most of the studies here are retrospective and of small cohorts, uh, which you know suggests that obviously more studies looking at this therapeutic uh, options should be done before it is um, widely recommended. Now, transurethral mitomycin C also uh, represents another treatment option for bladder neck contractor um, following radical prostatectomy. Mitomycin C is an antibiotic uh, which has antineoplastic and anti-proliferative uh, uh, properties. As a result, it inhibits uh, fibroblast proliferation, uh, collagen deposits, and uh, therefore scar formation. And patients should be really carefully selected um, before being offered mitomycin C as a treatment option because it should be avoided in all patients that are potential surgical candidates for reconstructive surgery. Because although it can be success a successful therapy in the management of certain bladder neck uh, contractors, it renders the tissue very tough and sloughy, making it very difficult to perform any reconstructive work at that level. Now, uh, in terms of, of studies, uh, Suriel and colleagues did report uh, findings on a cohort of 29 patients with uh, recurrent bladder neck contractor following prostatectomy. Um, they injected 0.1 milligram of mitomycin C into uh, cc's of uh, normal saline into the bladder neck at um, the 3, 6, and 9 o'clock before dilating the bladder neck to a caliber of 26 uh, French. And then afterwards, they inserted a 16 French uh, uh, catheter, which stayed in for three days. They reported actually a long-term success rate of 79% after one treatment and 86% after two, after a salvage treatment uh, was, was performed. And 69% um, of uh, their patients had an entire incontinence procedure, which was uh, successful in all cases. Now, while their results um, do look promising, Redshaw and colleagues have looked at mitomycin C as an agent to treat bladder neck contractors in 55 patients, and their procedure was similar to that of uh, Suriel and colleagues, um, but they reported a 58% success rate after one procedure and 78% uh, after two. But they also reported serious um, adverse events as a result of mitomycin C injections. Um, notably, two patients developed osteitis uh, pubis and more severe and extensive bladder neck contractor, eventually uh, requiring a cystectomy. And another patient had a rectal uh, urethral fistula and necrosis of the bladder floor, and they required both uh, fecal and uh, urinary diversion. Um, and then lastly, they also had a patient that developed necrosis of the bladder neck, uh, which resolved eventually with conservative management. So needless to say, these complications are quite significant and mitomycin C should be used uh, judiciously in carefully selected patients, if not at all. Um, now, drug-coated um, catheters for the treatment of bladder neck contractors haven't yet been studied in that population specifically, but they've been explored for the management of urethral strictures and are show have shown some promising results. The procedure consists of pre-dilation or DVIU followed by insertion of a balloon at the level of the stricter. It's then inflated um, fully, and then they remove it five minutes afterwards. Um, they have the robust one trial, which looked at uh, patients for three years following um, the procedure and demonstrated essentially an improvement in voiding, IPSS score, quality of life questionnaires, as well as QMAX and a decrease in PVR. And... It appears as though um, one of the limitations to use it in, in bladder neck contractors at this point is that the uh, balloon goes up to 24 French, which would be a bit uh, too small for a uh, bladder neck uh, procedure.
Now, uh, the MimoCath 045 uh, stent is a new technology proposed for the management of uh, bladder neck contractors. So previously stents like the Urolume had really poor success rates and high complications rates, uh, which led to stents really falling out of favors um, for this indication. And the MimoCath is a uh, newer generation of, um, uh, of stents that have been proposed for the treatment of bladder neck contractors. Now, the insertion of uh, the stent is done in two steps. So first, the patient undergoes a dilation or an incision up to a 30 French uh, uh, caliber, and then they measure the stricture, stricture um, or I should say, bladder neck contractor uh, length, and the patient is discharged home with a Foley catheter. They then come back two weeks later uh, following their initial OR and uh, a um, stent is uh, inserted at uh, that time. And the results of uh, these co this cohort uh, study show an improvement in IPSS from an average of 20 pre-op to 10 at 12 months after the MimoCath stent was removed, as well as improvement in uh, quality of life scores and uh, Qmax and decrease in PVR at that time as well. So this part of the presentation will focus on surgical and salvage therapies, notably uh, scar excision and uh, primary reanastomosis, um, robot YV, uh, plasty buccal mucosa graft, as well as urinary diversion. So when a bladder neck contractor is uh, refractory to minimally invasive uh, treatment, surgical management should be considered. Um, this usually is undertaking, uh, undertaken by um, excision of the scar tissue followed by primary reanastomosis. Several approaches have been described, including an abdoperineal uh, bladder neck reconstruction technique. And uh, Schulzberg and colleagues um, reported a successful procedure, uh, but with the caveat that incontinence rates were uh, quite high, and most patients ended up requiring um, a staged uh, procedure to have an AUS placed. Um, perineal approaches have also been described, but again, a uh, need for an AUS following bladder neck um, uh, surgery is is quite significant. Now, uh, robot YV plasty for uh, bladder neck uh, repair is another surgical option, which has had great success uh, here at VCH uh, as well. So um, during the procedure, cystoscopy and uh, near infrared fluorescence imaging allows for the exact location of the bladder neck contractor. And then the bladder neck um, contractor is incised anteriorly and a V-shaped uh, bladder flap is advanced into the bladder neck contractor in a YV plasty. Um, plastic fashion like you can appreciate uh, up here in this image. Um, the anastomosis is then performed between uh, the bladder neck and uh, the urethra with a 3-0 V-lock uh, suture in a running um, fashion. And then the bladder mucosa is closed on either side of the V with a running 3-0 V-lock uh, suture. And then finally, the detrusor is uh, also closed on either side. Um, a full catheter is then inserted and usually removed um, after two weeks following surgery. And the authors here, uh, Granny Nellery and colleagues, uh, have looked at a cohort of seven patients and have had a 100% success rate at 90 days. Now, um, buccal mucosa graft uh, for a recurrent bladder neck contractor uh, represents another surgical option for patients for recalcitrant um, bladder neck contractor. Now, several techniques have been described, both uh, robotic and open. Nonetheless, either uh, approach is essentially involve the excision of scar tissue up to the point where uh, healthy tissue is encountered. And then uh, buccal mucosa graft is anastomosed over uh, the site of the scar you excision, as uh, you can appreciate on this uh, image uh, right here. Um, the Silva and uh, colleagues have reported high uh, success rates of um, in 10 of their um, patients in a series of uh, 11. And most of their patients had complex disease that had rendered them uh, catheter dependent preoperatively and postoperatively only one patient uh, suffered of chronic retention requiring uh, CIC.
Now, uh, for some patients, uh, urinary diversion represents the best option uh, from both a functional and uh, quality of life improvement uh, perspective. Now, this is usually an option for patients with unsalvageable urethral or uh, bladder neck uh, disease. Um, now, what's really important here is shared decision making. Um, because we need to make sure that uh, the proposed treatment is consistent uh, with the patient's uh, lifestyle. So chronic uh, Foley catheter, either urethral or suprapubic, would represent um, a good option for patients if it is something that they would tolerate and would be comfortable with. But in cases where radiation across a necrosis is uh, present or if there is uh, severe bladder dysfunction, complex fistulas, or if uh, reconstruction of the urethra is impossible, then a cystectomy with allyl conduit um, should be offered to these uh, patients. Now, um, the last part of my talk is uh, just going to be centered on patient-centered outcomes and uh, incontinence. So bladder neck contractures do have uh, an effect on uh, urinary continence. So typical bladder neck uh, contractor presentation is that of lower urinary tract symptoms, um, namely reduced uh, stream following radical prostatectomy. Urinary retention uh, is uh, usually what will happen afterwards. Patients tend to present within six months following surgery, and uh, investigations will usually show um, uh, decrease in Qmax with an obstructive pattern on a uh, urophometry. And the diagnosis is, as we mentioned earlier, made on a urethro slash cystoscopy. And we can see a narrowed uh, bladder neck where we can't pass a flexible cystoscope through. Now, bladder neck can, a uh, bladder neck contractor can also present with incontinence or during the workup of post prostatectomy incontinence. So, we know that bladder neck contractors uh, represent an independent risk factor for urinary incontinence following radical prostatectomy. And bladder outlet obstruction, secondary to a contractor, may worsen the overactive bladder symptoms, and that will worsen the component of urge incontinence. But bladder uh, neck contractors might also impair the ability of a preserved external sphincter um, contraction to cause the bladder outlet, uh, to close the bladder outlet uh, efficiently. Bladder neck contractor um, causing bladder um, outlet uh, obstruction might also mask the severity of incontinence because of sphincteric deficiency. So treating the bladder neck um, contractor is the first step, um, but it can also have either a positive or negative effect on a patient's uh, continence. Now, in terms of the management of uh, concomitant uh, urinary incontinence and bladder neck uh, contractor, um, Bang and colleagues looked at a uh, at 37 patients with bladder neck contractors and concomitant uh, post uh, prostatectomy incontinence. Their patients with bladder neck contractors were treated with incision, and um, if it was recurrent, they repeated the incision, and if stable, they proceeded to continent surgery. Their findings when uh, following up with patients uh, for 13.1 uh, months found that 87.5% um, had a successful outcome following their AUS uh, procedure, and about half patient of the patients had a um, male sling. Um, about half of the patients that had a meal sling procedure were, had also successful outcomes. And uh, in those where um, failure of treatment was noted, they were offered an AUS. Now, obviously, radiation therapy also plays a role here. Um, so essentially, recalcitrant nature of a blood neck contractor correlates significantly with the presence of radiation therapy. And a combination of a more severe and recalcitrant bladder neck contractor with post uh, radiotherapy overactive uh, bladder symptoms will clearly affect um, the uh, outcomes of um, uh, post prostatectomy and continent surgery. Now, finally, uh, when looking at quality of life in uh, prostate cancer survivors, um, we see that you know, regardless of uh, the treatment that is chosen by the patient, there's no difference in quality of life at five years, depending on uh, the modality. 
However, um, the modality that is chosen will have different impacts on different spheres of quality of life. And surgery is usually uh, associated with um, decreasing quality of life in the urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction uh, sphere, whereas radiation uh, will see more irritative slash obstructive symptoms and uh, bowel dysfunction. And over time, these uh, effects uh, persist and were found to be related to disease, um, to the disease itself or the treatment. Um, but not to other factors um, like age. Now, when we look specifically at bladder neck contractors, we know that patients tend to develop uh, infections, urinary tract uh, retention, um, sorry, urinary retention, and um, will often require several surgical treatments. Uh, and then sometimes they'll end up uh, having incontinence if they did not uh, already um, have it previously. And all of that will negatively impact their quality of life. So in conclusion, um, bladder neck contractor following radical prostatectomy is challenging to treat, but there are several uh, effective, minimally invasive therapies that are uh, available to patients. Careful patient selection for treatment-specific modalities will highly affect treatment success, especially when there is a history of radiation therapy. And finally, when evaluating uh, patients with a post-prostatectomy incontinence, it is really important to assess for and treat bladder neck contractors before any uh, surgical attempts are made at treating post-prostatectomy uh, incontinence. Uh, and that's it. I'm happy to take any questions.